Hey, you are listening to Abyss Gazing, a horror podcast where we celebrate all things spooky and mental health. I'm one of your co-hosts, Mark. I'm one of your other co-hosts, Billy. <laughs> I'm so getting used to that. I'm one of your other co-hosts, Josh. And today we are joined by the Ghouls Next Door, friends of victims and villains. First time on this show, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kat and Gabe, how are you doing tonight? We're alive. Yeah. <laughs> we're doing good we're doing good we did chat with you once we chatted with you about uh district nine other podcasts oh it was <laughs> the other podcast <laughs> we're observant it's fine <laughs> uh mark and i started this podcast back in 2020 i think okay i don't know time we start one yeah. I think we started like doing it what like bi weekly or once a month or something. It started out very slow. Yeah. Now here we are weekly, but uh some of the victims listeners did not transfer over to Abyss Gazing. So or some of them just don't like horror like we do. Mm. Can you one of you uh happen to kind of give us a rundown of what the ghouls next door is all about? Yeah, uh, we're a media literacy podcast from a horror lens. So essentially, we talk about the real life cinematic and uh, psychological, anthropological motivations for our fears uh, that we kind of make the movies make sense. Uh, So recently, we covered like Get Out and Us and covered all the historical context to why that was really impactful. Uh, And generally, yeah, we just try to like look at media why it was made all right well gabe here's a question for you if you had to give listeners three episodes to check out which three would you suggest that's a great question of the ghouls <laughs> uh oof, um okay yeah i'd say you know our recent series has been really quite fun and uh educational i think it's it's been a great blend of the things that we you know strive to do so um i think our episode about they clone tyrone is really awesome uh specifically just because uh cat taught me a lot of things in their section (laughs) i didn't know and so my distrust for the government is at a high um (laughs) so if you also want to be afraid of the government uh i implore you to listen to the ghoul six story anytime but uh especially that uh also um a review of don't worry darling i uh, that was earlier this year and Mm. uh we keep bringing it back just because there's so much that we wanted from it. So that's a kind of, those are two examples of like a film we really, really loved in They Clone Tyrone and a film that we didn't love, uh, <laughs> but that was okay, which is uh, Lord, Don't man. Worry, Darling. Um, Kat, can you pick our third one? Sure. Um, it really depends on what your vibe is. So uh, the ghouls have been doing this for like six years, maybe more. Uh, it's been a long time. Uh, so there's like kind of a ghouls for everything. I would mm-hmm. say one of my, like, if you want silly fun times where we're both exhausted and just laughing a lot and making weird jokes about the environment, our wilderness series is really funny. Um, our apocalypse series is really funny. Uh, but I agree with Gabe that our most recent series where we've been like really getting back to our roots with the historical context and why the world is stressful um, and why movies are made about why the world is stressful. Uh, our most recent series with like uh, Big Clone Tyrone, Us, Get Out, uh, Don't Worry Darling, and uh, there was a whole new one in there. Oh, Culture Shock. Culture Shock, yeah. Mm-hmm. And Possessor, and then this week is uh, Infinity. Infinity Pool. Oh, yeah, those last two were a trip. <laughs> to keep, keep coming across, I keep coming across Infinity Pool, but never have the never taken the time to see it. Same it's, thing with Possessor, uh, yeah. You it's know, a lot, that. it's okay, it is a it's lot. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, uh, Mark, do you like uh, do you like his father, David Cronenberg? Um, I'm gonna sound like a dumbass for a second. What has he done? It's uh, the end of my work day, so 
<laughs> We're all on the same page. No, that's so good. No, that's silly good. Uh, so he he's really known for like his body horror. Um, so like existence. What's the yeah, one I'm with the like exploding think. heads? Yeah. Scanners, Scan the fly, yeah. uh, yeah. video yeah. drone, the brute. I've seen a handful of those. Crimes mm -hmm. of the future. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We don't I wish we did a podcast on. Wasn't a fan of Crimes of the Future. Yeah, no. neither uh, were we. That that's funny. Again, that was my first podcast. The, was about that specific film. Yeah, that's that. He showed up as a guest one day and came uh -huh. back as a guest. Like a month <laughs> I never later. left. That's cute. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's kind of the same, same story with me. I showed up as a guest for a movie like six or seven years ago and never went away. You. <laughs> You have to frame it in a different way because you almost kind of make me sound like I keep guests as like hostages and <laughs> or pets. I was you're not allowed pets. to leave. It's a collection of friends. Oh, yeah, I like that. We'll say a collection of friends. Yeah, we used to have a narrative that we kept all our uh, guests in our basement that was uh, rumored to be haunted. So. It and if that's for legal reasons, but but if uh, that's the case, Josh would also be in our basement. So yeah, <laughs> came for hereditary and got sacrificed in the end. Yeah, I've all been there. <laughs> well, before we jump into this, uh, the film we're talking about today, where can people find you guys online? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we're on Instagram, uh, YouTube. Anywhere you find podcasts, Spotify, you can watch video versions of us. We usually get dressed up and like look crazy um, based on like whatever characters are in the movies or whatever kind of like gore theme is happening. Uh, I was in a saw trap one time. That was fun. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so we're on YouTube, Ghouls Next Door, all the social media is Ghouls Next Door, except for Twitter, where we had to lose the E, I believe. Yeah, and, but we're on threads at schools next door. So oh, not that going for us. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> you look up schools next door. I think we show up basically. Yeah. Anywhere. And we have a, a very, uh, like Kat said, six plus years, I think we're at seven years. Um, of wealth of content so you can also check us out at the ghoulsnextdoor.com we do create blog posts uh if you want to do any further research or look into some of the things that we dive into because it sometimes gets pretty deep all right before we jump into the commercial break though question for the ghouls yes what is i forgot that a part of the programming was the the dressing up <laughs> what has been the most fun to do but also the most like pain in the ass <laughs> um i okay i'd say uh this is one of my favorite of cats uh is uh mr bedevil from the movie bedeviled uh what this a time <laughs> anytime cat like becomes like transitions into a creature of some sort i am there for um we even dressed up for like Steven Universe, like we painted ourselves colors. And uh, I would say for me, it wasn't a pain in the ass, but it was really fun when I was jigsaw for that episode, um, or uh, I was a tether for us. Like we've we've been having a lot of fun. Um, and then runner up is anytime we have to uh, gender swap and become men. Uh, most recently, I was Jason Statham for the yeah, Meg 2. <laughs> So definitely look great. that up to see me bald. Um. <laughs> I remember that. It was very funny. Uh, I totally agree. Anytime that we can, I think uh, the funniest for me was when I did, we did Don't Look Up and I had to be, what's his name? <laughs> Leonardo his DiCaprio. Name? Leonardo DiCaprio. And I was like, have you ever seen me and Leonardo DiCaprio in the same room? We have to be related. Cause I look just like that man. And I like stenciled on a beard to my face. It was very funny. Um, <laughs> and yeah, honestly, we did an animal theme series, like animals that can kill you. That was really good. Cause Gabe was like, a, a crocodile at one point and a snake and like yeah. still looked cool it was very fun and a sloth gabe was yes. also a sloth um, so yeah we get into it it's pretty fun That's all. even more reasons for listeners to check out and watch 
the ghouls next door. But uh, we will take a quick commercial break. The song that you guys are hearing now, this is Even by Dens. And if you guys like what you hear, click the link in the description below. Or you guys can also check them out at our St. Paddy's Day celebration at Garden Grove Brewing Company on March 16th here in Richmond. We'll be right back. If you or someone you know is listening to this podcast right now and you're struggling with suicide, addiction, self-harm, or depression, we encourage you guys to please reach out. This is the heartbeat of why we do what we do. Suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. And as of this recording, there are 132 suicides that take place each and every day on American soil. And when you scale back internationally, there are 800,000 successful suicides. That is one death roughly every 40 seconds. So if you were someone you know is struggling, you guys can go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope. That resource is going to be right in the description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this. There you'll find resources that include the National Suicide 
Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-8255. You can also text HELP to 741-741. We also have a plethora of other resources, including churches, getting connected with counselors, LGBT resources like the Trevor Project, and also Veteran Hotline as well. Please, if you hear nothing else in the show, understand that you, yes, you listening to this right now, have value and worth. We get it. Suicide, depression, mental health, these are hard topics, and the stigma around them doesn't make it any easier. But please, consider the resources right in the descriptions below, wherever you guys are listening, because... Once again, you have value and you have worth. So please stay with us. And we are back. Welcome back to Abyss Gazing. Mark, what are we doing today? I forgot the name of the movie, but it's from Takashi Miike and the Masters of Horror series. It, it didn't leave an imprint on you? Oh, yeah. Imprint. <laughs> Come on, Mark. <laughs> Thank you, Billy. <laughs> Wink. <laughs> yeah what he said <laughs> I I know when we when I had a, approached the ghouls about doing the an episode with us that Takashi Mike was one we talked about doing Japanese horror and it ended up being Takashi Mike I've only seen a very small handful of his films but didn't you at some point end up doing like an episode on him for people to check out if they like what we have to say we did um mm-hmm. it is in the way way back machine um when <laughs> pre pre pandemic and just kind of pre us in a way like our we were still developing our show but it was during our horror director series you know we did like Guillermo del Toro and some others um and we did we did re- we did watch imprint but funnily enough did not leave an imprint because I forgot I watched it. Um, <laughs> Which is like, honestly, after watching it, I think now, I blocked like, it out. If you watch a Takashi Miike movie, you pretty much don't forget it for the most part. <laughs> yeah, Unless there were drugs involved. Yeah. <laughs> or you're trying to protect yourself mentally. Yeah. Yeah. All, I would. All of his movies are that messed up. I. Uh, yeah. I would agree. This uh, this is the probably the first movie I've seen in a long time that I like. I said I've only seen a small handful, but this was one that definitely made my skin crawl a lot. And it's a slow, but just where the torture happens, it they spare no expense. It did is, I did I not ride. tell you when we, <laughs> when we were discussing this? Did I not tell you he makes fucked up movies? No, you did. And I, I've seen very like like I said, I've seen a few of his movies. Which ones have you seen? Probably Ichi the Killer. Yes. Mm-hmm. Everybody's seen Ichi. And I The Audition. The, I, I've seen bits and pieces of Audition. I've never yeah. seen all the way through. So Izo, one of his earlier movies, Izo, starts with like a soldier up on an X X shaped cross being like run through with spears and stuff and it just opens up with him being tortured and murdered on a cross and the whole movie is just him like running through a city murdering everything and everyone trying to get revenge and figure out what happened it's got bob sap in it which is kind of funny interesting (laughs) i uh I'm also he did blade of the immortal which i want to see because it's an adaption of a samurai manga and Mm. anime I am also kind of curious on the flip side of this being a Takashi Miike movie. This is also Masters of Horror. And Masters of Horror was like this powerhouse t- like TV's show that like created these like mini movies. Yeah, I think it was on Showtime or Cinemax back in the early 2000s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they didn't air this one on Showtime. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know if that's what you were going to lead into. But no, <laughs> I was. It was they not said not to it's US. too much. Uh, yeah, we said do whatever you want. Yeah. Uh, and I read interviews with him, and he was like, literally, like, hmm. You know, they really said do whatever you want. And I was like, okay. And I made this thing. And then they said, oh, wait, not that. 
<laughs> to, which like I, to which I'm like, oh yeah, no, that's reasonable. That was a reasonable response. I thought this Washington. was a free country. Yeah, 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 that's what it was. <laughs> it's, <laughs> not, it's not. <laughs> so they said no, not on Showtime. Uh, it's not. We can see boobs, but we can't see torture. It's okay. <laughs> Well, that I don't think it's so much they can't see torture. It's how graphic and intense oh, yeah. and the length of the scene. It's like a 62 minute short that, like, a tenth of it, six, seven minutes of the movie is a torture scene. Yeah. Which, which is wild to me because historically, what separates a, like, let's say an action sequence, you know, when you look at something like, I'll, throw a mainstream popular movie out there uh captain america winter soldier that movie has a lot of action in it has a lot of gunfights and you know people quote unquote die in those movies and the reason that it's allowed to keep a pg-13 film is pg-13 rating is because you're not showing blood, blood. and mm -hmm. there that's the difference between a pg-13 and an r when it comes to violence this one has like almost literally no blood for the most part like this is a pretty Tame movie, and this came out during from a blood aspect from a blood aspect, <laughs> yeah, but, also, the <laughs> but also comes out at the at the height of torture porn, and sh but I show he, Showtime misses uh, uh misses the the chance to capitalize on that by airing this, even not airing it, even by the torture porn aspect, this is extreme for that category. I would agree, yeah. That's fair. Uh, like Saw, I mean, I guess Saw is like probably light a version of that, but like it is. <laughs> Which is amusing when a scene is, is so intense and graphic that you refer to Saw as torture porn light. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think yeah, the part... Sorry, yeah. I was just going to say, I think the, dif the difference between something like Saw and like Hostel, right, is uh, the motivation of what's happening in the scene and like the emotional attachment. Because like I can have a visceral reaction to things happening to a body, um, but I think there's more it's there's so many more layers to it in this. Like he's not just you know torturing a body. He's torturing like a soul um, of the viewers. And that's just an entire different which is why i could see them being like whoa hold on we need an exorcism versus okay let's crash in on some of these like you know unsettling you know body horror elements. well i think you're also seeing the difference between asian horror and american horror mm -hmm. american horror depends heavily on jump scares and action and blood and gore uh asian horror builds a lot off of atmosphere and superstition and telling the story and setting the mood. And then you get something like this in the middle of it. And it's just that much more intense because it's built to that point where when you watch something like a Halloween or a Hellraiser or anything American, almost it's just violence and jump scares and how much can we do in 90 minutes? to get it on a TV screen or a movie theater. My hypothesis for why foreign horror tends to, to go there in a way that American horror doesn't uh, is that we haven't had war on our soil <laughs> in this in a very long time and they it's it's very real for them and the the trauma is just like really on the nose and I think that can influence uh, creators and like their own cultural history of like how they're you know, family was impacted by some of these bigger issues that America, we send, we send our people away to do that. And then they come back and we ignore them instead. So uh, I think that's, that's a big influence. So I absolutely agree with you. I, well, hold on, Mark, let me, let me jump in here real quick. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to, I'm going to spoil this, uh, but if you guys haven't seen uh, in print, it is, uh, it is now streaming with the map, the rest of masters of horror on Tubi. Or at least but, the first two seasons. Yeah, at least the first two seasons. Uh, but Gabe, to to go off of your point, specifically, uh, even you know, it has different cultural standpoints for beauty. You know, I I understand like this takes place in the 19th century, but our main character, who is just credited as being called woman, who happens in the end to be revealed to be like the Siamese twin, um, 
you know, also is kind of disgraced, not only among the uh, her family and like s- small community, but also at the same time, um, also among the uh, the rest of the the, the ladies brothel. Yeah, I guess. I was trying to think of like the technical respectful term for it. Um, but yeah, brothel. Um, yeah, and you know, she's like an outcast. Like, there's a scene in there where like basically the i guess like the head mom of of the the brothel that kind of comes in and like condemns her essentially in komomo is the one that's kind of showing her love and so not only are you seeing foreign it's this is this is why i like watching foreign horror is because you're getting a it's atmospheric to where you're under you're stepping into another culture and what makes them different than americans yeah, I remember when we first talked about uh, the film, a big thing that we really took from it is that, like, the entire film is just, like, a representation of, like, what trauma could be um, and really, like, pushing into that in a really intense way. Um, and I think Gabe and I both, by the end of it, were like, oh, we're just really happy he makes movies um, <laughs> instead of doing different stuff. Uh put these feelings in his head yeah Yeah. that's kind of the vibe that we landed on by the end of it yeah it's and i don't think it's so much because they've had war throughout which japan if you get into their history has just been a war-driven country for its existence um when you start getting into like the the shogunate and that whole series of hundreds of years but um i I think it's more of asian horror in general tends to lean into a lot of superstition and beliefs of their cultures as opposed to the war itself because a lot of it like the ring has certain aspects of superstition in it the original ring ringu um Mm -hmm. with it has what's his name hinato hinato Sakata, I know I'm butchering the dude's name or not remembering it right. He was Scorpion in the last Mortal Kombat movie. Uh, mm-hmm. He was uh, Ujio in um, The Last Samurai with Tom Cruise. Um, super decorated actor in Japan, but has little almost bit parts here in the States. Uh, although he does have a major role, apparently, in Shogun starting up here in a couple days on FX, which I'm super excited about. But yeah, when you get into a lot of the Japanese horror and Asian horror in general, it, it deals a lot like Malaysian and Indonesian horror deals a lot with the smaller villages and some of the village beliefs and superstitions and things like that, which is something I don't feel like a lot of America has is a lot of superstitious beliefs, or if they are, they don't play into the culture like it does so much in Asian countries. I think we did end up covering something about that. We had, uh, I wish I had a memory, um, but we did a series on Asian horror and we did get a lot into the kind of like lore and uh, the connection to like our relationship with death and like the superstitions that come in with that. And yeah, it gets really interesting with how uh, they really kind of bend the horror genre to do something very different than what we see in America. And I feel like that's why their movies are so popular over here is because they are just so different than the like mainstream horror that we see uh, released. Billy's kind of lost over there. I'm not lost. I'm just listening. <laughs> well, Mark, I think to your point, um, you know, I, I would dare to say that a lot of the, in, Cat, if you guys end up doing an episode, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the, at least from the way that I understand it, is the the mythos, the reason that they are created are a lot of the same reasons to kind of almost be parables for things that have happened within the country or is it like a response to something? Is that correct or am I speaking out of turn? No, I wouldn't say you're speaking out of turn. I think, and also like, I would say that's really, really prevalent, especially in uh, Korean horror. Like there's a lot of history and just also like environmental fears. There's, you know, uh, classism fears that that come through. And that's, I mean, that's what horror is. And 
I, that's something that I really appreciate about the horror genre is that we get a glimpse into like the traumas or the history or the, the impacts, the imprints that, you know, these, these situations leave on people. Um, and it, it resonates in these films and as horrifying <laughs> appropriately and inappropriately this film can be. Um, I do think there is like this, you know, this need and this desire to share some truly like hard things. Um, and I think that's why he is so uh, equipped to create uh, hundreds <laughs> of films uh, and to create them so so frequently because they're, it's, you know, overflowing the amounts of things that you can pull from. He just chose a lot of things for this piece. Um, and I don't know if he needed to pick all the things uh, or to <laughs> tell them in the way that he did, but he did, you know, and for somebody, uh, I'm sure it was really, truly enlightening in a way that wasn't re-triggering. <laughs> Yeah, I, I read a really cool uh, interview with him. It was on the outline, and they basically he, he basically said in his own words, he was like, "A sculptor is going to take a piece of stone, and they're going to say, that's this is what I want to make.' Uh, they don't do that. They say they're they just start sculpting it, and they the stone turns into whatever it wants to be. And he says, like to me, mm -hmm. that's filmmaking. Um, and I think that comes through in that. Like he's like, "What can I do here?" And then it kind of the story builds upon itself and to what it became i'm gonna be real it was a lot for me personally i don't know if i liked it <laughs> um, but i do get it from that standpoint where i was like he was just like you know i'm gonna let this become what it's meant to be and this is what we got and it was interesting we, yeah, this movie is just wild the way that it it builds upon itself and unfolds and evolves and I, for one, I can't speak for everyone else, but I, for one, liked the way that it felt like there was this really simplistic, like, love story, you know, man trying to be reunited with this woman, and it kind of had this, like, really sense of hope to it, and then you get to the, the scene where she steals, like, she gets accused of stealing the jade ring, and it's just, like... I don't know particularly what it is about needles going into mm -hmm. like fingernails and like yeah. specifically into like the, the regions that she gets them in the mouth. Like you've, you've never had a splinter under a fingernail. Have you? Uh, it's been a long time, but man, you like it was, don't forget that. <laughs> yeah. That shit hurts. It was, it was real, real hard to watch a lot of this. And then like, you kind of, as the, the narrative like kept changing, you kept going back to that sequence and it just kind of seemed like there was a shift in how the torture element, depending on which version of the story you got. How would you guys like to help us get mental health resources into schools, conventions, and other events? Well, now you can. Simply go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains for as little as $1 a month. You guys can help us get mental health resources into current and upcoming generations, educate and break down stigma surrounding mental health, suicide, and depression. And you get exclusive content that you can't get anywhere else. And you guys can tell us which Nicolas Cage movie you want us to cover, and we'll do it. All it takes to get started is to go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains or simply click the link in the episode description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this episode. Pick your tier and get started today. Yes, it's that simple. So quickly select the tier that you want and help us get hope into the hands of the depressed and the suicidal today. Yeah. I, I really think being overseas is better for Takashi Miike to make movies in because he would never get some of those movies out over here through Hollywood. Never would happen. And I, I, I've heard, and I, and I may have referenced it previously, but Del Toro has said he almost left Hollywood trying to make Mimic because they wanted to be so involved and make him change everything away from how he wanted to do it. 
he almost left Hollywood completely and went independent back to, uh, I think, in Mexico doing Spanish movies. If you watch his Spanish stuff compared to his uh, American Hollywood releases, they're almost night and day in atmosphere. Yeah. And I, I think you would end up with the same thing if Takashi Miike were to attempt to do major Hollywood releases. They would have to rein him in to fit what they want, as opposed to giving him the freedom to do what he wants. And and I mean, based there, based on his quote, though, I will say, like, I don't think he would agree to that because he really sees it as an art form. He'd probably be like, nah, I'm not doing it if I can't make the art as freely as I want. And yeah, but that's that's basically what I was saying. Is he yeah. he couldn't work in Hollywood? Yeah. They would they would try to put too much control over what he's trying to do for him to actually be able to work properly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But there's also something like really refreshing about that, where like we're hearing like you know one of the stories that you know has been circulating around the news cycles recently is is Kyrie versus Acne. you know this was a completed film and Warner Brothers was like ah we're just going to shelve it write it off as a tax break and you know they're so organized with it and then you have other films that we've seen that are these big blockbusters that feel so micromanaged that it it hurts the narrative it hurts the story the the acting feels off-putting in certain parts and then you jump into a film like imprint to, to even as disturbing as it is and it feels refreshing because you're actually getting to see an artist that is just completely allowed to embrace the art for art's sake and i I don't think i don't feel like we see that a lot here with aside from like independent films i respect it i (laughs) wish i didn't have to say it (laughs) <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you i've seen this twice at this point the first time i don't know why it did not hurt me this time it did it hurt, me. It it hurt, did. Me. It hurt you the first time that's, <laughs> I that's know, literally but... what we said in the episode was like we have not hurt like this uh in a very long time and we have a whole podcast dedicated to this <laughs> yeah. so I'll say is, the level to which i was impacted this time was just different and i was i was like angry i was like i don't want to feel this way uh, after watching it it's okay all right so i i, I want to ask a question and it'll it'll veer a little bit away from the disturbing nature of this movie but in the end when the woman becomes komomo can someone explain that to me like that was the biggest question i had about this movie was is does she have the ability to like be a shapeshifter was was that like a personification of his grief she had a talking hand on the side of her head yeah and you're questioning that Look, Sim- Siamese would, twins, my guy. That's I would. There's science. I was going to ask that. if it was in his head. I mean, the, it brought up about his sister and everything else, and it kept jumping around so much. And then at the end, he was in the prison, and you're like, to me, it was like, okay, what really happened? Is you know, is it in his head? Was he seeing this in his head the whole time, and had he lost it, or did it really happen? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's a mix of one. There's no reliable narrator, right? Like the like one of the main themes is like there's this lack of trust because uh, the truth, like the truth, is hidden and it, it it keeps coming back in different forms. Like she has to keep t- retelling the story, and even when we get to the end of the story, it's like, do we know that that's the story really? Um, and then you know, bringing in that conversation of folklore, right? Like that she's embodying this folkloric creature um, that can manipulate the truth or or, uh, manipulate your own thoughts and feelings to reveal your guilt um, or your own internal pain. And so I think that's what it was. So I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say she's, she was really her. um, And I also would say that maybe that didn't really actually happen. (laughs) as well like kind of going really (laughs) sad well i think in some of his other films he's on some similar things where the story changes and it's retold yeah i'm just trying to remember which ones they are but i think there's a couple of them he's done where 
the like in this one she's telling the same story but from a different take on it almost almost like she's testing him as to how he's going to react to the different versions of the story leaving him confused and not knowing what to think to begin with because which one's the true story to make him break basically yes yeah yeah so I would say, yeah, at the end that it was his like breaking away from what reality was if he wasn't already there in the grief of the loss. Uh, yeah. How many different yeah. versions of the story did he hear by the time it was over? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And does it even matter? Right? Like the truth, does it actually matter um, when yeah. we're just thinking about what his impact was? Right? Yeah. And like the loss and the grief there for sure well one of the things that you know uh this this film does thematically is uh so at some point in the film as she's explaining to christopher how komomo is no longer with us and that ultimately it ends up that like she has taken her own life like i've been on the receiving end that's what look mark let me go with this (laughs) <laughs> stop stop picking apart you know but uh, you know that but the the before you find out that the the narrative switches or you know that it, the narrative is no longer reliable it's presented as she hung herself and you know he is a now a suicide loss survivor and having been a suicide loss survivor myself i understand and identify a lot of that journey of like how deep that grief runs and how long it runs for um to you know whether or not it's an unreliable narrative or not if if all the events of this movie are a product of his grief it would make sense um even to the point where like when he's like in the prison at the end and he's uh, in the fetal position over like the water bowl that is revealed to have the fetus in it. And then you have like the, the small child and Komo- Komomo right there. Like it, it would make sense that like, you know, if you know, something along those lines. Yeah. I mean, I, from a trauma standpoint, our brains really try to fill in the gaps and make sense of scenarios if they feel unfathomable. Uh, and I, I, I feel like that's what it, was was very much like him trying to rationalize everything that happened like once you hear that someone you love is gone like you're i don't i doubt he was even really listening to her at that point because the trauma kicked in um and that that probably transformed everything even further like if we're taking it for its word you know like we're saying like that's reality that's what actually happened and we're following that train uh that uh it was very likely trauma motivated. His brain was just trying to make sense or even twisting it in his grief to be what it ended up at towards the end. And to point out the small child was supposed to be his sister that he lost, that it never told us how he lost her. So mm-hmm. you, so that can build into it too. He lost her and then turned around and lost Kamobo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did they mention something about losing a sister? I don't remember mm-hmm. that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And and it showed her uh, walking through the house every so often, like at the very beginning, if you catch it, when they first go into the room. Oh, is that what the ghost was? And that was the ghost girl was his sister. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I from a that. trauma standpoint, like that could be really triggering, like even just to reactivate that loss, you know, like it's it kind of compacts on top of each other well especially too if like that one memory of his sister ends up becoming a repressed memory and actually ends up you know being unresolved and komomo essentially like triggered it again and ultimately now you have two deep trauma wounds that are created as a result rather than just the one Mm -hmm. i don't know how I missed that. Because you're Mark. Yeah. True. I forgot the name of the movie. So there's a lot going on in there. You're allowed. <laughs> you're allowed to lose all thread. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah that, it did have a lot going on. I mean, it hit on what? It hit on incest. It hit on mm-hmm. abortion. It hit on trauma. It hit on mm-hmm. 
sex trafficking. It hit on, I mean, murder, torture. I know I'm missing yeah. something, but it, it hit on tons in, in that one little hour movie. It was like the Rule 42 of trauma, like or whatever it is. Like it's just like all the so, worst things you could think of. Let's put them all in here. Uh, all the bad things humanity is capable of doing. Let's have that take place for you to witness. And it is effective in that way. I know yeah. humanity is garbage. Uh, I knew it before, but I know it extra <laughs> now. Um, I mean, if you capacity for that. If you've ever gotten the opportunity to talk to like some of these soldiers that have been in war or uh, police, they'll tell you TV is nothing compared to real life. That anything you see on TV is 10 times worse in real life what people are capable of. Yeah. Because you're, see you're seeing what somebody imagines the worst things to be not what some of these people have actually done and it yeah. just it, to know that this it's just kind of like the tip of the iceberg of how bad some of this stuff can get just kind of makes it a little bit more creepy which with also this being in the taking place in the 19th century japan i also think it's like you know they're pulling from like history as well mm -hmm. um and so there's there's probably like an undercoating of like historical accuracy to some of this stuff like um to see the the i think one of the most like disturbing parts that is like not and i don't know how you guys felt felt about this but like for me was the opening scene when he first gets christopher first gets to japan and he's like walking down the the corridor of just bars and you have all of like the the brothel and like all of the women are just like you know grabbing at them that to me was 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 really really disturbing because then you got to get into this this whole conversation of of sex trafficking and like pretty much uh, borderline and like rape like we actually see basically a rape within this uh movie as well yeah i mean it starts with like being the woman you find in her in the water with the boat like it starts really just like intense mm -hmm. with just like the discarded human that you're have to kind of grapple with that immediately like it's yeah i i agree like the beginning even though it was like the lightest part of the film starts still very heavy uh and painfully yeah and to, and to point out she was pregnant too yeah it's, it made a point to show that she was pregnant which yeah. kind of builds into the movie because uh, it dealt a lot with what babies and abortion and pregnancy kind of. So like, that was just the beginning. Yeah. And like I, I've seen like when she like first like comes to Christopher and she's like, um, you know, I, I present my body to you. You can do whatever you want. Like that to me, like I, I've seen like other historical dramas like approach subject matter like that but that to me like seeing it in this light especially with how this movie progresses was something that was really disturbing and like i think that that sequence later where she's like giving the account of uh you know how her life in the brothel has been and you kind of see that sequence with uh through the veil where like she's on her stomach and she's essentially like having sexual intercourse and you know he's belittling her the entire time and it was just you know I, we don't talk about it enough in america but i mean these things do happen on our own soil and you know this is still like a very real trade within our our world as a whole yeah i mean it's not referred to as the oldest profession for nothing wow <laughs> really mark it's been around through history whether voluntary or for forced through pretty much the existence of civilization if not longer i think a line that happens at the beginning really sets the tone that uh it was a, i feel closer to the dead than the living it's the living who scare me and I think that really was the thesis 
of the film, at least in my mind, is that like the people who were here are the ones doing the most harm and the ones who leave escape that uh, in, in the uh, horrificness of that. I would 100% agree with that. Um, yeah. You know, you, the ghouls going through kind of the worst right now thematically with, you know, uh, in, in your content, I would even dare say that, I mean, this is like such a, a great companion piece to what you, you both are doing over there. And it's, I feel like I was talking to my, my therapist about this today. Like, I feel like it is just getting harder to be a, alive it, it seems like some days because oh. of just all of like the the crushing weight of like the news reports and new bills or like gun violence or rape or human trafficking and that list just goes on and on and on and there's an element of like secrecy that we just kind of like try to like you know we know it exists but we don't ever talk about it or address it until it's like in our own backyard. And, you know, for me, I, I grew up knowing and under having an understanding of, you know, suicide specifically as an issue, but didn't really comprehend how massive of a deal it was until I lost a friend to suicide. And then the, it just seems like the entire perspective flips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's very hard to be a person right now. Um, which is like, that's a big thing that we try to do because we can appreciate that, you know, horror is this genre that could approach some really heavy topics and kind of share and have this, uh, catharsis that comes from being able to like, let this out and also to bond over, like to, to find those pieces where we're like, okay, I know what that is like. I have experienced that and then I can release that. Um, but simultaneously, like our show also understands that that can get very heavy and that, that we don't want people to leave with that weight, <laughs> which like I think Mike absolutely wanted people to leave with that weight, which is absolutely OK. Um, but that's why we, we try to incorporate, you know, like, you know, our next steps or resources. So it's like, here's this really bleak, horrifying, awful topic that was splendidly done in a film or horrifically done in a film and here's what you could do about it so that you don't feel so oh, hopeless and yeah. disgusting and just like yeah to to feel that way that we feel like every day where we have to get up and go to work and do the same you know regular things i'm answering emails when there's the world is on fire in so many places um and that's such a hard thing to grapple into like with your brain um so yeah i i really appreciate um that whole sentiment no i'm right there with you sometimes sending emails are the hardest things <laughs> kat gabe thank you guys for for joining us once again where can people find you guys online Everywhere you get your podcasts, um, we're the ghouls next door, uh, as well as you can watch us like in our costumes and, and all of that on YouTube. Uh, we also break up our episodes into facts and films. So if you're just in it for a film review, you could check out my section. If you want some really fun facts and histor history, and I say fun loosely, um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's has not been fun. Not. It's been like, oh, wow, OK, CIA is responsible for the crack, crack epidemic. That's cool. Um, you could look at Kat's facts section. Uh, but we're also visual on Spotify. We're a video podcast on there. Um, and check out our blog, the ghouls next door dot com uh, to see our resources as well as like our sources and and just if you want to read it it's accessible yeah we want it to be so that if if you don't feel like looking at us that you can at least still learn the stuff sometimes people just prefer audio podcasts because it's easier to just lay on the go than sit down and Wow. Yeah, that's why we have both, you know. <laughs> we have all three, baby. We got <laughs> however you want to ingest this information, we have provided it for you. <laughs> Mark, where can we find you online? So I'm getting ready to ship some of the project I've been working on and talking about. So there's going to be some pictures probably going up this weekend. 
uh, titanium juggernaut painting on Instagram. Billy, where can we find you? You can find me on Facebook, WTaver3. You guys can find me on one uh, letterbox <laughs> at Captain Nostalgia. Uh, and you guys can follow our podcast, Abyss Gazing, wherever you guys get your podcasts from. Also, check out the Ghouls Next Door as well. You guys can follow our parent company, Victims and Villains. We are on Facebook, Instagram, Patreon, YouTube, and wherever you guys get your podcasts from. So until next time, remember, the longer you gaze into the abyss, the more the abyss gazes back into you. <laughs>